in this problem we've got a 50,000 kilogram airplane and it's empowered by a turbojet engine and the engine draws in fuel at 2 kilograms a second, it draws in air at 150 kilograms per second and as the air passes through the compressor the pressure is increased by a factor of 20. The fuel's got a heating value of 40,000 kilojoules per kilogram and the question's asking us based on this information what is the initial acceleration of the airplane if it starts from rest and full power is immediately applied to the engine and we're to assume the engine operates on an ideal jet propulsion cycle and we're given the ambient temperature and pressure of 27 C and 100 kilopascal and it says assume constant specific heats for air of this value and a heat capacity ratio of 1.4 in a turbojet engine, there's effectively five points. There's the inlet to the compressor, there's the exhaust or the exit of the compressor, uh, which enters the burner section, and then the exit of the burner, which enters the turbine, and the exit of the turbine, which enters the nozzle, and then finally, point five, the exit of the nozzle. So to solve this problem, what we want, we want the acceleration of the airplane, and by uh, Newton's law, we just say the acceleration is equal to the force of the thrust divided by the mass of the airplane. So if we knew the force of the thrust, we know the mass of the airplane, we'd have the, the problem solved. If we did a momentum balance around the engine, we'd find that the force of the thrust is equal to the mass flow rate of air times the difference in velocity, V5, the velocity exiting the nozzle, minus the velocity entering the front of the engine. And if we make the assumption that the velocity of the air entering the engine is very small compared to the velocity exiting the back of the engine, we can say that V1 is about equal to zero and the force of thrust is just m dot times the velocity exiting the nozzle. The thermodynamics we need to work with will allow us to calculate the velocity at V5. We know the mass flow rate of air, it's given to us, and therefore we can find the force and hence the acceleration. The key to solving this problem is to do a series of energy balances and some isentropic considerations. One energy balance we could do is an energy balance around the compressor section of this engine. So you've got mass flow of air coming in, a mass flow of air leaving, and there's shaft work entering the compressor. And the amount of shaft work entering the compressor, which is used to compress the air, by a factor of 20. So P2 is 20 times bigger than P1. And this shaft work comes from the work output by the turbine. But let's just do an energy balance around this section first. So here's our general energy balance equation. The uh, compressor is adiabatic. There's no significant heat transfer in or out of it. The potential energies are about the same. There is no work leaving the compressor, so work out is zero. And the velocities entering and leaving the compressor, although they're different, they're, the differences are really small. So what we're left with is the uh, amount of shaft work entering the compressor plus the rate at which enthalpy is entering the compressor is equal to the rate at which enthalpy is leaving the compressor. And if we use a constant heat capacity, we can calculate this relationship for the amount of work coming in and the temperature difference, T2 minus T1. And because the uh, amount of work entering the compressor is a positive value, we would expect the temperature at 2 to be greater than the temperature of 1. So shaft work going into the air, it heats up the air by the time it leaves the compressor. And though it's heated up, we don't know how much. But because this is an ideal compressor, it's uh, isentropic, it's adiabatic, and it's reversible, we can use a relationship for an ideal gas that isentropic compression, because the two entropies are the same, T2 is equal to T1 multiplied by the pressure ratio in this factor for K. And if I plug in values for this, here's the ambient temperature, pressure ratio of 20, and this uh, factor of 1.4 for K, I find that the exit of the compressor, it's not even reached the flames yet, but the, the temperature has been raised from 300 degrees Kelvin up a little over 700 degrees Kelvin. We now know something about the state of the air at point two. Let's turn our attention to the burner and let's do an energy balance around the burner. So around the burner, there is no shaft work coming into or out of the burner. There is no heat leaving the burner itself and any differences in kinetic and potential energies are both negligibly small. So what we're left with is the rate at which heat is entering the burner plus the rate at which enthalpy is entering the burner is equal to the rate at which enthalpy leaves the burner. So again, we'd expect, if you look at it for an ideal gas, we say Qn is equal to MCP times the increase in temperature between as the air exits the burner itself. And in that case, if we know Qn, we can calculate T3, the temperature, at the exit of the burner, just by rearranging this algebraically. And we do know Qn because Qn is the rate at which the engine's consuming fuel multiplied by the heating value of the fuel. 
So here is the uh, chemical energy associated with burning the fuel itself. And if I plug in numbers for this, there's 80,000 kilojoules per second of heat entering the burner. And that heat is used to heat the air from 0.2 to 0.3. And we come up with a temperature exiting the burner, a uh, little over 1200 Kelvin. So we're working our way through this problem. We know the temperature leaving the burner. Let's focus attention on the turbine itself. Let's do an energy balance around that. So here's a simplified form of the general energy balance equation. No work in, no heat in, differences in kinetic and potential energy are negligibly small. So we've got enthalpy entering the turbine is equal to the rate at which shaft work is leaving the turbine plus the rate at which enthalpy is leaving the turbine. In the simplified form, we can say the rate at which shaft work is leaving the turbine is equal to the mass flow rate of air times its heat capacity times its difference in temperature. So we expect a positive value for the rate at which work is leaving. And in that case, we would expect T3 to be greater than T4. We'll see a temperature drop across the turbine as shaft work is being extracted from it. And another thing to consider is the fact that all of the shaft work leaving the turbine is going into the compressor itself. We can use a relationship, the rate at which work is leaving the turbine equals the rate at which work is entering the compressor. And plugging in relationships, again, energy balances on both, will come up with the differences in temperature based on the mass flow rate of air and the heat capacity. And if we plug in numbers for these, solve for T4, the temperature leaving the turbine at 0.4. And I can calculate a value because I know all of the upstream temperatures. I can calculate the temperature leaving the turbine is a little over 800 Kelvin. And this, I might add, is a very important thing to recognize for jet propulsion cycle. Another important thing to recognize is that the expansion through both the turbine and the nozzle is isentropic. So you've got a perfect turbine and effectively a perfect nozzle. So the expansion between 3 and 4, this isentropic expansion results in shaft work leaving it. And the expansion between 4 and 5 results in the conversion of enthalpy at 0.4 into kinetic energy at 0.5, which we're really interested in for the design of this engine. So what that says is that the entropy at state 5 is equal to the entropy at state 3. And then for an ideal gas, we can use this relationship to find the temperature at 0.5 as a function of the pressure ratio. So plugging in numbers, we get a final value. The temperature at 0.5 of the exhaust is 526 Kelvin. So we see a temperature drop between 3 and 4 because shaft work is being removed, and a temperature drop between 4 and 5 because we're generating kinetic energy at the expense of internal energy at 0.4. Even though the expansion is isentropic between 4 and 5, I didn't use a relationship there because uh, we don't know the pressure at 0.4. All we know is that the pressure at 0.5 is 20 times less than the pressure at 0.3. So we do know that pressure ratio. So that allows us, based on the fact that we know the temperature at 0.3, to find the temperature at 0.5. Now let's do an energy balance around the nozzle. There is no shaft work entering or leaving the nozzle. The nozzle, let's say it's adiabatic, there's no heat entering or leaving. Let's say that the differences in potential energy, here again, is, is zero. So we know the velocity leaving the nozzle is a very high velocity. And let's say the velocity at 0.5 is so much greater than the velocity at 0.4 that the velocity at 0.4 is essentially zero. So there's very little kinetic energy at 0.4 as compared to the kinetic energy at 0.5. So here's the simplified form of the energy balance. Note that the mass flow rates of air cancel out of this expression, converting kinetic energy at the expense of enthalpy. So here I'm solving for V5, and if I plug in numbers, I come up with a velocity of close to 800 meters per second. And note the conversion here of 1,000 joules. This seems to be a common mistake. Uh, students will forget the fact that this is kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. We need to convert to joules. So we're almost done with the problem. We do know the force of the thrust is equal to the mass flow rate of air times the velocity at 0.5. And plugging in numbers, I come up with a force of 117 kilonewtons, or a little over 26,000 pounds, which is a, a pretty typical force for a turbojet engine. So finally, we'll find the acceleration, this 117,000 newtons divided by the mass of the airplane. And we come up with an acceleration of a little over 2 meters per second squared. And for airplanes, you often hear the acceleration in terms of g-forces. So I'll take this value and divide by gravity. And I come up with an acceleration in the forward direction of 0.24 g's.